Welcome to today's uh, Sharma's Astrophysics Virtual Seminar. Uh, we um, are at good capacity with the network, so I don't imagine any issues at all with the um, with the, uh, the, the Zoom settings. Um, if anyone does have any issues, please um, check your own internet. It's probably, you need to turn your video off and that should hope, hopefully uh, not cause you any problems further on. Uh, so, um, let's see. Uh, so the, as, as, as always, for anyone new who doesn't realize, to ask a question, um, it's good if you can use the little raise your hand icon. So if everyone can try that now, if you go to the participants, um, window or, the, or uh, you should be able to see the um, raise your hand icon and everyone, everyone can raise their hand. Then do most people seem to be managing it? Um, you can always use the chat window if you can't, um, which is uh, in the bottom panel of your screen um, to ask any questions. Uh, so you can interrupt the speaker if you need to or um, save the questions to the end and we can deal with them then. Um, today's speaker um, is given, uh, the seminar is given by Julia uh, Zeidel from um, the University of Geneva, who's doing a PhD there in the Exoplanets Group with David uh, Aaron Reich. Um, so uh, Julia, if you want to take it away. All right, let me uh, just share my screen and show you my wonderful slides. All right, do you all see my starting slide? Yes. Very good, all right, then let's start. So today I uh, would like to talk to you about um, ultra-hot Jupiters and especially what we can learn from them through transmission spectroscopy and through transmission spectroscopy from the ground. And uh, first I wanna, oop, highlight uh, my two th supervisors, um, Professor Ehrenreich and Dr. Bourrier, who have been uh, very kind to me in the last three years. All right, so like a quick outline about this. First of all, I wanna tell you why you of all people should care about exoplanets because they're amazing. Um, my very biased opinion, obviously. Then when you already got excited about exoplanets, why would you care about ultra hot Jupiters and what are these? And then um, the majority of the time I'm going to spend on um, a little bit of atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric dynamics of these uh, very hot worlds. All right, so let's dive right in with a little bit of history, because um, back in 1977, something happened that I always find absolutely fantastic, which was the launch of the Voyager probe, which was meant to actually leave our solar system and um, you know, go as far as, as any object has ever gone that was man-made. And back then, we were doing this absolutely fantastic feat for humanity, but we had no idea if there are exoplanets or not, if there are planets outside of our own solar system. And even 13 years later, in 1990, when Voyager finally left our solar system and sent us one of the last actual pictures before it only transmitted other data that was a little bit less heavy on the bandwidth, um, we still didn't know that they were exoplanets. So this is the famous portrait of the solar system, the so-called pale blue dot picture, which is Voyager turning around and taking a picture of the solar system while leaving it. And this is not dirt on your screen, that is the pale blue dot for those of you that like me weren't alive when this picture was taken and don't know it yet. So that's literally all of us. But still at this time when this mind-boggling picture was taken, we still didn't know whether all the planets that Voyager has, had just passed by are the only ones in the universe or not. And it took another five years until 1995 until that conundrum was solved and the first exoplanets was found. So we could go here on the y-axis where you can see number of exoplanets from zero to one. And that was such a fantastic discovery that NASA even 20 years later um, had a, a big commemoration and called it the discovery that changed the way we see our universe. Um, the discovery of 51 Pegasi B, which as you can see here as an artist rendering is an ultra hot Jupiter that, well, an hot Jupiter that orbits a sun-like star. So a star that's basically a twin of our own a sun. And 
well, that was such a mind-blowing discovery that last year these two guys got the Nobel Prize for it. And uh, just because obviously I have to mention it, both of them are Swiss, so plop. There you go, NASA, two Swiss people found the first exoplanet. And since then, the landscape of exoplanets has changed quite significantly. So from the first discovery, things were a little bit slow for the first few years, but especially in the last decade, discoveries of exoplanets have literally skyrocketed to up to over 4,000 um, exoplanets discovered to date. And uh, the most interesting part here is in 2016, where you see this, this bump, basically, where one of uh, the space missions dumped all of their data. And we are still trying to analyze um, all that has been done since then and to find the most interesting of the exoplanets. And uh, at this point, I just want to highlight my favorite Danish person, because uh, Louise Nielsen is the one that in Geneva tells us which ones are the most interesting of the exoplanets and which one we should uh, look at for atmospheric characterization. She's just about to finish her PhD, so look out for her papers. She's really, really good at this. All right, so now we know about exoplanets, but how do we actually find these? And there's a few techniques to find them. And the one that I wanna highlight today is transmission photometry simply because um, we also needed to characterize their atmospheres. And the way you can think about this is a little bit like the bat signal. So if you're um, Captain Gordon on the top of the building and you use your light to put the bat signal on the sky, that's basically the same thing what happens in transit photometry. You have your light source in our star that would be the host star of the planet and you have some surface where that light gets collected. In this case, it would be the sky. In our case, it would be some big optical telescope. And then something comes in between the light source and the projection surface, obscuring part of the light. In this case, it's the bat signal. And in our case, it's a planet. So from the nominal flux that you expect from the star, part of it gets obscured while the planet transits. And this is what you get here. This is the phase of the transit and the flux, and you get this dimming that indicates the presence of a planet. Well, this is something that you can also use to not only say, okay, there is a planet, but you can say, okay, there is an atmosphere in which elements are in the atmosphere, and that is called transit spectrometry. And that's basically just instead of looking at the white light that comes, you split the light in all the different wavelengths in the optical, because while it traverses the atmosphere of this planet, some of these wavelengths are absorbed by the elements that are in the atmosphere and don't make it towards us, meaning that in some wavelength, the obscured disk is bigger than in other wavelength. And you can kind of think about this um, as a different estimation of radius of the planet. So if you scan through all the different wavelengths in the optical here, depending on which element interacts with the specific light in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed or not absorbed. And you can see this absorption depth or this height above the planet's surface with the telescope. And you get kind of this nice plot here. And remember this plot because I'm gonna talk about this one an awful lot in the next half hour or so. All right, I think now you have a pretty good understanding of why exoplanets are super cool and why it's such a new field uh, where a lot of um, astronomers are trying to dive in right now. But why would we care about ultra-hot Jupiters in this context and what are these planets? Because there are no ultra-hot Jupiters in our own solar system. And to give you a little bit of context, um, here is our own sun and a star that hosts an ultra-hot Jupiter called WASP-76. And WASP-76 is an F-type star, about twice the size of our own sun, so the light is um, much more in the white part of the, uh, it looks a little bit whiter than our own sun. And here in the x-axis, you see the logarithmic distance from the host star in AU. And obviously this is not to scale, but still, um, here you have obviously Earth at one, which is the definition. Our own Jupiter is about five AU. And the innermost of the planets in our own solar system, Mercury, is at only 0 0.4 AU, which is pretty close if you think about it um, in astronomical um, scales. But 
now these algebra Jupiters. So what does it mean to be an algebra Jupiter? Well, first of all, it means to be kind of the size of a Jupiter. And it also means you have to be really, really hot. And the easiest way to get hot is to be really close to the whole star. Again, this is not to scale, although WASP-76b is about twice the size of our own Jupiter, but it's ridiculously close to its whole star. Just remember, this is a log scale, so it's just mind-blowing. And um, to visualize that, because WASP-76b is a very interesting planet that I'll mention a few more times, ESO actually made a two-scale video of the system. So this is an artist rendering of the WASP-76 system where you can see the real size relation between the star and the planet. Again, the planet is about twice the size of our own Jupiter. And you can see a few interesting consequences right here. First of all, it's really close, meaning that it will go around its host star quite a few times. So we'll see a lot of these transits where the planet crosses between us and the star. And like our own moon, it's tidally locked, meaning that one side of the planet always faces its host star and receives a lot of irradiation from it. And the other side, the so-called night side, is in eternal darkness. And just to give you a little bit of a visual of this, this is Kelt 9 b another algebra Jupiter that is distance-wise exactly in the same spot as WASP-76b, just around a different host star. And the size of the star in the sky of Kelt 9b is about 70 times bigger than the apparent size of our own sun on Earth, which means that it's about 35 degrees in angle, and it's so hot on this ultra-hot Jupiter that you have this red-yellowish hue from iron and from iron irons that are vaporized in the atmosphere, which I think is pretty wild. So just a quick summary, what are ultra Jupiters? They have really short periods, they are tidally locked, they have very, very high temperatures about above 2000 Kelvin. And this high temperature and also the low molecular weight of the particles in the atmosphere mean that the atmosphere has a big scale height. And the scale height is nothing else but a measurement about how puffy is the atmosphere. So how far into space does the atmosphere extend? And these planets have, well, you can basically call them evaporating atmospheres. They really reach high into space. And as a result, obviously, algebra Jupiters are relatively easy to observe. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean we actually found that many of them, because what you can see here, it's um, the Kepler mission that dumped their data in 2016. And before that, here on the x-axis, you can see all the exoplanets that we've found so far split into the different um, size categories, from Mars size all the way to Super Jupiter on the right, and the number of planets. And before the Kepler mission, well, you know, statistically not really significant numbers, but there were quite a bunch of Jupiter-sized and Super Jupiter-sized worlds. But then when the Kepler mission did its job, it came, we came to realize that it's actually a detectional bias that we had so many of these Jupiter-sized worlds, and they're not that common. And if you now look at this a little bit more in detail, and instead of only being interested in the radius, which is now on the y-axis, you also care about the irradiation that these planets received, which is here shown on a log scale as the insulation flux, both of them in units of Earth. So the Earth would be at 1-1. And just to give you a little bit of context, our own Jupiter is about 11 Earth radii, so just below this up cloud here on the top. But the insulation that it receives is so low that it wouldn't even be on this plot here. Um, now I just want to highlight the three planets that I want to talk about today because they're really showcasing what ultra-hot Jupiters are all about. First of all, it's what I would call an ultra, ultra hot Jupiter, the hottest planet we have ever found, Kelt 9b, which is really out there, literally. And then WASP-76b and WASP-121b, which are basically twins. So they're very, very similar to each other. And now the obvious question is, well, why would she talk about these three when there's this entire cloud of detected planet, planets just with a little bit less of insulation? And um, well, that's quite um, interesting because all of these Jupiter-sized worlds that we found receive a little bit less insulation, making them hot Jupiters and not ultra-hot Jupiters. 
And the difference between these two categories is quite stark because for ultra hot Jupiters, um, the temperatures are so high that we assume that chemistry is either in equilibrium or as close to equilibrium as it gets. And the consequences are important because it means that molecules are most likely dissociated into atoms on the hot day side of the planet, which means that there are no clouds to worry about in the models. There are no condens there's no condensation to worry about in the models, making ultra hot Jupiters benchmark cases for hot Jupiters. And if you can't understand these, let's call it easy targets and easy atmospheres, it will be very hard to understand hot Jupiters and it will be basically impossible to understand planets even closer to our own Jupiter and draw conclusions whether the worlds in our own solar system are unique or not. All right, so now you know why ultra hot Jupiters are so amazing and why I spent the last three years of my PhD working on them and our entire working group spends a lot of time studying them. And with this, I wanna dive into their chemistry because I already hinted at chemical equilibrium but it's always nice to you know, have some theoretical idea what something should look like. And then on the other hand, you actually wanna you know, check that on real data. So as I promised, there it is again, just as a reminder, when you look at the different wavelength and you split it up, different particles in the atmosphere can interact with the light that traverses from the whole star towards us through the atmosphere. And if it gets absorbed, the planet in this wavelength bin will look, will look a lot bigger than it actually is, giving you this absorption profile either in height or in absorption depth, depending on what you choose. And in a perfect world, that would look like this. So this is the theoretical absorption for iron and uh, iron ions at about 3000 Kelvin um, from the lab, split up by the wavelength, and here you have the flux and obviously the flux diminishes if light gets absorbed. So that would be fantastic. That's every astronomer's dream. You get this wonderful profile and everybody's happy. Unfortunately, reality looks quite different than that. So in reality, what you have here is simulated um, data from the Hobbes spectrograph at ESO's 3.6 meter telescope in Chile at about a signal to noise ratio of 600 and as you can see, you can see nothing. There's just noise. So you can't see the nice peaks of absorption because if you check up the noise free template of iron and iron plus is just hidden underneath all of the noise. And this is where cross correlation functions can save us because we already know from the template where all of these lines should theoretically be. So what if we now cross correlate the template with what we have in reality with the data. And then we combine all of these tiny signals that are now in a wavelength. And we say, okay, if we set each and every one of these lines in velocity space to center to zero, and then we combine them, maybe we can boost our signal so far up that we can actually see it even with all the noise that we get from the telescope itself, from our own um, atmosphere, um, from the rotation of the planet, there's plenty of things that come into play here. And this is what Kitzman and Al uh, did in 2018 on theoretical data for Cal 9b. And this is what you get. So for the whole transit, here you have all the exposures taken during the transit. So each exposure is kind of a snapshot, one step after a time during the transit, and this slope that you can see here that I just drew a little bit shifted to the side so that you have kind of something to orient your eye on. You can see that it's not centered at zero velocity but that it kind of for each exposure where you summed all of the iron detections together you get kind of a hint of a trace. That's not enough yet to really claim a detection because you really have to squint hard to see it but you can fit for the slope that is the movement of the planet because all of this was done in the rest frame of the star and not of the planet and obviously that thing moves during the transit. And if we now shift to the planetary rest frame where all of these get lined up in a straight line and then we combine these exposures of the entire transit together, this is what we get. And this is really cool for two reasons. First of all, 
the heat map shows you this white or relatively light dot. That is the detection of iron. And you also get a measurement of the velocity of the planet from the slope that you fitted for it. So this was theoretical work. And in the same year, parallel to this theoretical study, Jens Hömekes um, did it on the actual data for calc 9 b for neutral iron, ionized iron, neutral titanium, and ionized titanium. And uh, what you can see here in the first two panels is what I just showed before. So you can see the trace of the planet for all the in-transit exposures. They are marked with the dashed white lines that you see in the uppermost panel. And then you correct again for the slope, you sum all of them together and you get the middle panel where you can see really nicely the very strong detection of ionized iron, neutral iron and ionized titanium. But you can't really see anything for neutral titanium. And if you look at this heat map as a normal graph and signal to noise, you can see that for neutral titanium, there's no detection. And by itself, detections are nice, but obviously we always want to draw conclusions about what we just found. What does this mean for Cat Line B and for ultra hot Jupiters in general? And this is what Jens did. So he looked at the theoretical prediction. If I assume chemical equilibrium and I look at the theoretical mixing ratio of these elements for different abundances um, at different temperatures. And we know that um, calc 9 b is very, very hot. So it's roughly at like 4,000 Kelvin, roughly around that. And we can see that the most abundant element and the highest detection should be for ionized iron, which is exactly what we saw before. Then the next two, the green and the blue, are iron and um, titanium ions. And at this temperature, titanium should be mostly ionized. So the abundance, which is in log scale here, is really, really low. So it's not really a surprise that we don't detect it. And the interesting thing is that this is in perfect chemical equilibrium. And calc 9 b is as close to this theoretical case as you can be. So calc 9 b is really in chemical equilibrium, which is not entirely surprising, but still very cool. And here I just want to highlight Jens because Jens just took a permanent position at the University in Lund, so he'll join you quite soon at the end of the year there. So look out for his work, you'll probably see a lot more of it in the years to come. And with that, I want to go a little bit further down in the temperature regime because I already told you that calc 9 b is basically an ultra, ultra hot Jupiter. It's really out there. But if you now look at WASP-121, um, which is basically the sibling of, of WASP-76b that I will talk about in a few minutes, then things get a little bit more complicated. So back in 2016, Evans and Al took some data with the Hubble Space Telescope that you see here in the wavelength range of STIS and, and Spitzer, the two instrument, and you see here the absorption height in percent. And I know that most people that work in the solar system, on solar system planets laugh at us because we are really like trying to fit three data points. And um, so what they did, they're a theoretical group and they were like, okay, we have very, very sophisticated chemistry models for um, exoplanet atmospheres. And now we try to fit these three data points and we'll tell you what's the best fit. And fitting the bump here on the right at about 1.4 micron is relatively easy. That's the water band. So they were like, check, done, easy. But the three points here between 0 0.4 and one micrometer in wavelength are a little bit challenging. And they said, well, I mean, we don't really know what this could be because um, here in purple, you can see what like most of the atomic species would be. There's potassium and sodium, basically what I showed you before in the, in the GIF, but the band is much higher than that. And they explained it with a mixture of titanium oxide and vanadium oxide with a little bit of iron hydride sprinkled in there, which is a pretty wild claim actually, because where does this come from? So wild that, a tiny war between two theoretical groups erupted with the Pomontier group in Oxford being like, well, but we can explain this just fine with ionized hydrogen, which is here the red band. And then the Evans group was like, yeah, well, I mean, we kind of agree on the ionized hydrogen, but we still think that you need the vanadium 
after they took even better data to explain this bump in the middle that's here in, in the pink data points. And this just shows you how hard it is to really draw good conclusions about atmospheric chemistry when you fit models to data points um, without actually trying to come from the data side of things and extract what you can really see in the data. And uh, work has been ongoing by a lot of groups. They found iron and some ions that was pretty good. But then we decided, okay, enough. WASP-121 has taken too much time from our community. Let's unleash the cross-correlation technique and look for everything. So everything that has adequate line lists, obviously, because if we don't know where the elements are, there's not a lot to be done about it. So um, Jens and I have spent um, a significant amount of time in the last year looking for all of these elements that you see in the lower right corner. And we found um, sodium, magnesium, calcium, vanadium, surprisingly, chromium and nickel, as well as iron, which is not too surprising um, when, if you remember what we just found out about kelp 9 b But uh, some of these elements are still in question because the line lists sometimes aren't very good, so you can't really apply the cross-correlation technique. Or in the case of vanadium oxide, that band is completely hidden under um, some other molecular bands that summed up um, have the same structure. For example, the magnesium um, triplet is very, a very high absorber and the vanadium that you detect as well. So the vanadium oxide is basically hidden under all of these other elements. And this just shows you that compared to Cat9b, we find some of the same uh, ingredients. We find iron, we find um, ionized iron, we don't find titanium oxide and we don't find titanium as well. So there's a lot of the same chemistry happening. But because we are a little bit lower in temperature, um, we do have some of the oxides, like for example, probably vanadium oxide, although it, it's overshadowed by other elements. Um, so that you have a lot more chemistry-wise happening that you need to understand properly before you move further down to the hot Jupiters. So now that we've kind of cleared up a little bit of the chemistry, so we know um, most of these elements should be um, disassociated, we know there should be iron, there should be ionized iron and all of these things, what does that mean when we move to our atmospheric dynamics? Because just having all of these elements in chemical equilibrium isn't going to cut it anymore um, if um, we, we go to worlds that should transport these elements around the atmosphere. And what we did is basically, well, I mean, from the cross-correlation technique, we can only learn about if these elements exist or not, but not really what is happening to them. But if you remember this plot, and I hope you do, you can see that some elements are really, really good at absorbing light because they have resonant lines. For example, here in the yellow, you can see the sodium doublet, which is a Fraunhofer, uh, the Fraunhofer D doublet, um, that even at very, very low concentrations of sodium is very good at absorbing the light. So we were like, okay, what if we don't go via the cross correlation, we look directly for sodium, maybe the absorption is actually strong enough um, to see it in the spectrum. And this has been done many times. So yes, we already knew that this is possible and you don't actually need that much telescope power. So this is the 3.6 meter telescope in La Silla in Chile that's operated by ESO. And this is me just for size comparison because that thing is huge. And it has the harp spectrograph attached to it, which we used um, for, for this endeavor. And only three transits, so three nights of observation combined are more than enough to really resolve the sodium in the atmosphere. And this is what I did um, after the first year of my PhD. So I looked at the WASP-76 data, which funnily enough, at, in the very first month of my PhD, I actually took myself in Chile without knowing that I would spend most of my PhD working with this data. And uh, what you can see here is the relative flux in the wavelength band of the sodium doublet, and you can really nicely see uh, the two uh, absorb the two peaks of the sodium doublet, and they are resolved at about 
11 sigma, so it's a pretty decent detection. Um, but what you can also see if you're a little bit familiar with spectroscopy is that these lines are a little broader than anybody would anticipate. So if we make use of what we've learned from the cross-correlation technique and we now combine these two lines for higher signal to noise in velocity space, then you can see, first of all, that sodium is absorbed really high up in the atmosphere at all different levels of the atmosphere, um, but also that the line is really broadened because the Harbs instrumental line spread function, so basically the sensitivity of the instrument to detect the line width is shown in yellow, and what we detect is a lot broader than this. So this is not just instrumental broadening, but this really exists. And this, in fact, so large that a tiny part of the particles here in the outermost line wings is even around the escape velocity. So the, the sodium really goes out far, far in the atmosphere. And now the question that I asked myself is, okay, but what does this mean then? Why is it this broadened? Where does it come from? And um, what I did is um, that I used work done before by two groups, by Pino et al, who is now in Italy, and by my own professor in 2006, who created the ETA model and the pi ETA model based on it. It's basically a forward model to describe an exoplanet atmosphere in transmission spectroscopy. And to their work, I added um, Doppler broadening by different possible wind patterns. So for example, the atmosphere could be super rotational, meaning it rotates faster than the planet itself. There could be a day to night side wind where the hot wind from the day side that always faces towards the planet comes around the atmosphere in all directions towards the observer and then wells down on the much cooler night side or an upwards vertical wind where the entire atmosphere kind of gets blown away which could explain this fluffiness, like this evaporating atmosphere. So it just gets radially pushed away from the planet at a certain speed. And because I want to really know what can the data tell us at the current quality and not just fit different models, I combine this with a multi-nested sampling retrieval, which is possible because the model um, is very, well, basic. So it doesn't take that much in terms of computing power. And I published that earlier this year in case anybody's interested. And what we can learn from WASP-76b, which is really an archetype for these ultra-hot Jupiters, is first of all, a little bit of a sanity check. We can retrieve, don't, don't get too bothered with the different retrieval parameters here if you're not super interested in retrieval, but what we get if we just employ isothermal temperature, everywhere is the same, chemical equilibrium, hydrostatic equilibrium, the atmosphere is the most boring possible case, we can still kind of retrieve the correct um, equilibrium temperature for the planet and it converges nicely, so that's a, that's a very good sanity check. And, but that's still a little bit boring. So what I wanna show you is the, you know, the fit is pretty bad. But what I want to show you is a much better fit, which you can see here, where the planetary atmosphere gets a much more interesting um, dynamical wind profile. So in the upper right corner, you see what this should look like, that in the lower atmosphere, you have this day to night side wind, so the entire wind shell comes towards the observer. And if you go a little bit further out in the atmosphere, you have this vertical wind pushing the atmosphere outwards, which gives a little bit of an extra broadening, so to say. And um, what I want to highlight here is obviously, first of all, it converges really nicely. That's great. But also remember the day to night side wind, because um, what I retrieve here is about 7.5 kilometers per second, plus minus two to three kilometers, um, which is a number that will come in handy in a few minutes. And for those of you who aren't convinced by the smiley face of the planet, here's the Bayesian evidence that really shows that this, this wind pattern, and I tried a few others obviously, but this was the best one, and it's a really highly significant compared, compared to the isothermal case. Here you can see the fit to the D2 line of the sodium doublet, and 
from the day to night side when the position is a little bit shifted to a place that is more sensible and you can also capture this broadening relatively nicely. But um, there is now basically a new era starting for exoplanet atmospheres because the Hub spectrograph is nice, but now we have the Espresso spectrograph at the VLT. So we have an eight meter telescope instead of a 3.6 meter telescope. And that makes a big, big difference because um, what um, David Ehrenreich did in the beginning of the year as part of the Espresso Consortium, so there were a lot of universities involved in this study, is that they went and looked at WASP-76b but with Espresso. And although they used a different technique to arrive at this map, you should be relatively familiar with it by now. So this is on the y-axis, the time from the transits. So each of these um, colorful blobs stands for one exposure that you take took during the transit, where the dotted, the dashed lines here stand for when the planet has its ingress. So when it comes into the disk of the star, then you have the center of the transit, and then at the end, when it leaves the disk of the star again. And what you see here on the bottom is the radial velocity in the planet's rest frame, meaning that um, what you saw before in the cross correlation technique, what you would expect here is just, okay, all of the iron was detected nicely in all of the exposures and it should line up at zero. And it really doesn't. But what you can also see is that the temperature, uh, sorry, that the heat map that indicates the amount of iron that you have in the different exposures is much more pronounced than what you had before with the different spectrograph. So you don't have to add all of these exposures together to really detect iron. You can temporarily resolve the iron and you have a solid detection in each of these. And what you can see is, first of all, it's offset by about 10 minus 10 kilometers per second to the zero where you would expect iron if it was just sitting in the atmosphere. And second of all, you have this weird crease going on in the first half of the transit. And that, that's a little bit strange. So after lots of thought, they proposed a toy model to explain this, and I'm trying to walk you through this um, for the next few minutes. So what you see here is the host star on the left with the planet obviously not to scale, don't get scared, in the polar view where you can really see the day side that's always towards the, the host star and the night side that's always in the dark. And then the direction of motion is from, bottom, from the bottom to the top, where you have the leading limb that comes into the line of sight first, and then the trailing limb that comes in last when the entire planet is in front of the star. And what you take, have to take into account from a physical point of view for the system is, of course, that the planet is tidally locked, so it rotates at the same speed um, as it goes around the planet, uh, as it goes around the star which means for the leading limb, it's a redshifted to about plus five kilometers per second, and the trailing limb is blue shifted by about minus five kilometers per second when you look at it from the perspective of the observer. Now, if you now put iron in this scenario, because we know from our observations of WASP-121, which is the virtual sibling of this planet, that there should be iron, we have resolved the iron for this planet as well. So we put it in because of this tidally locked rotation, the hottest point is a little bit offset simply by virtue of this rotation. So the higher iron abundance should be in the direction of the trailing limb. Now that's a little bit concerning because already in the leading limbs so on the very first few exposures when you can only see the leading limb, we already saw iron. It was just doing this weird slope kind of changing velocities. And that can only be achieved if we add a day side or tonight side when so transporting this iron abundance, not only on the trailing limb, but also putting it over the leading limb. And if this day tonight side wind is roughly at minus five kilometers per second, then that would mean that in the leading limb, we are at about zero kilometers per second, which is what we saw at the beginning of the plot. And you will get about minus 10 kilometers per second for the trailing limb. So this is a very strong indicator that for 
that to see what we have seen for WASP76, we would really need um, the day to night side wind of about minus five kilometers per second, which is very interesting because with a different spectrograph, with a different technique, I retrieved a, a day to night side wind of about the same order of magnitude within the error bus. So that's a very strong indicator that these ultra hot Jupiters not only have iron, have all the ionized elements, um, some molec molecules going on, but they really have this stream of hot particles coming from the day side and going to the night side. Mm. And that has a very interesting consequence because um, what happens on the cool night side to this iron? Because the temperature drops quite significantly. And what happens is that the iron will condensate out on the night side, meaning that at the terminator, so between the eternal day and the eternal night, you will have iron rain falling from the sky on WASP-76b and most likely also on other ultra-hot Jupiters because this seems to be a mechanism that is um, quite universal to these planets. So what we have learned so far is that if we don't understand hot Jupiters, we will not understand hot Jupiters and we will most likely not be able to say anything about these worlds that are so foreign to us because we have no equivalent in our own solar system. We've also learned that these really, really hot planets, most notably Cal 9b, are most likely in chemical equilibrium. That the cooler you get, you have to be more and more careful with your assumptions and with what kind of models you fit because molecular absorption bands come into play and it gets really tough to just say, oh, this model is a very good fit when you, for example, forget a few of the molecules, your entire model breaks down, which we saw with WASP-121. And then we saw from um, the strong resonant lines that these ultra Jupiters are dominated by quite impressive wind speeds from the, a day to night side wind in the low atmosphere. And then you can also see this evaporating outward pattern um, in the thermosphere. Um, and then lastly, that we're kind of entering a new realm of exoplanet research. So now is the time to, to join this endeavor because the espresso spectrograph is absolutely fantastic. And it allows us to not only detect elements as with a cross correlation technique, but to really construct 3D temporarily resolved models um, of the elements in the atmosphere, which showed us that iron is traveling from the hot day side to the cool night side and draining out on the terminator. And I think the most important message is that exoplanet uh, modeling is really a little bit like the wild, wild west because it's such a new field. We've been barely at it for a decade and a half. And uh, you can always expect the unexpected from exoplanets. Thank you. Great, thanks. Let's give uh, Julia a round of applause. Do you want me to stop sharing? Um, well, no, it's fine. Um, we'll see if we have any questions that might be relevant for you to share a slide for All us. right. Does anyone uh, have any questions? Oh, we have a question here. Kay has a question. Um, Hi, I have actually two questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, but they are related. Um, I was just wondering, you, you have the days day side and night side right yeah. on, on these planets because of the uh tidally locked um yeah effect uh so i was just wondering uh what is the temperature difference between the day side and the night side and once you have this temperature difference does it affect also your uh chemical equilibrium oh. assumption yeah so this is an interesting one um because um it's really hard to me measure the night side temperatures. Uh, it's possible to, to realize these differences if you take secondary eclipse observations, so where the planet is kind of behind the star or like going behind the star. Um, so normally, so these differences can be up to a thousand Kelvin or more, so there's like quite impressive differences, but still this, these planets are quite close to their star. So for example, for Kelt 9b, um, even the night side is still still quite hot, but the further you go out, 
that differences be can become a little bit more pronounced. But yeah, so for example, this is why um, iron rains out at the terminator because um, the condensation temperature of iron just lies in this sweet spot where it gets vaporized on the day side and then it condensates out on the night side. Yeah, and, and this second question was whether this, this temperature difference on the day and night side affects the assumption of chemical equilibrium. Um, Good question. I think it does to a certain degree. Unfortunately, um, our data um, doesn't really help us that much in that regard, um, meaning that it's very hard from a chemical perspective um, for all of these theoretical groups that create these, these chemical profiles um, to really make a distinction between the day side and the night side, um, because what we see is literally just the limb or this tiny sliver of atmosphere that comes around. So there's a few, um, and uh, there's a few groups that try to uh, integrate uh, non-local uh, thermal equilibrium models uh, to it, so to say, to to account for this difference. But it's an it's an ongoing effort, and it's one of the bigger problems. Yeah. Thanks. Great. John has a question. Uh, yes. Um, uh, you, you've shown that uh, iron and uh, iron plus are very important in the visible spectra. And I'm just wondering if there's any possibility that uh, some iron two lines might show up in emission. I'm thinking in particular of the iron two lasers uh, studied by uh, Sven, Sven Erik Johansson and Lund uh, before he passed away. Um, uh, these are uh, actually uh, excited by accidental resonances with lime and alpha and uh, cool stars in their chromospheric spectra have intense lime and alpha and you put that source very close to such an atmosphere. It might be a possibility. So the, the summary of the question is, uh, is there any possibility for emission lines, especially ones that might be amplified? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there hasn't been that much studies in emission happening yet, simply because it's harder and we're battling photon noise because these targets are obviously very, very faint. But uh, there are some ongoing efforts from last year and from this year looking at emission lines and you're absolutely right. This is where we can really see these iron lines the best, especially in the near UV. So in, in the optical, getting ionized iron is pretty hard. This is why, for example, here on this slide, you see that our work, which concentrated in the optical, wasn't able to find ionized iron for WASP-121b, but the Sing et al. group the year before found them in the NUV uh, ab absolutely beautifully, so there was no question about it. So yeah, there's, a, there's plenty of, um, of possibilities to detect iron and ionized iron that is, that is outside of the optical realm. Thank and you. also in emission, yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, are there any more questions from anyone else? I can't see any. Uh, nope, we have no hands raised. We have no one in the chat window. No one wants to unmute them. Oh, Jonathan has a question. Nope. Yes. Kay has another question. Okay, do you have another question or was that your previous question? What do I do? Speak. <laughs> I sp okay. Hi, my name is René So I missed the, um, the volume. I couldn't hear you, so I was sitting here with Kay. And my question is very simple. In the, in the observation of the sodium D lines, yeah. I was wondering, would you be able to see the telluric lines? Oh yeah, you would be able to for the for the wavelength calibration, but I I couldn't detect them. Um, because we correct for them, so um, there is a a uh -huh. lot of work being done to get rid of this. It's the bane of my existence, telluric sodium and uh, telluric lines in general, because um, they really affect the sodium doublet. So you have to be very careful to first of all monitor the sky with a second fiber to get our own telluric sodium and then correct for it, but also to uh, get all the other telluric lines uh, from water vapor in the atmosphere. And you have to very carefully correct for that. Yeah, I understand. And that's why I'm asking it would be 
informative to see where the lines are and how they are contaminating your spectrum. Um, there's a, a bunch of very good papers uh, on this issue. First and foremost by Roma Ayal from like 2017 and they go really in detail to show uh, where these lines lie and, and what they do and how do they change also with the air mass that you observe. So it's a, it's a really cool paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I think that's it on the questions, unless we have any more for anyone? Nope. Uh, okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And yes, thank you very much. Um, and uh, next week, we're not sure if we're going to have a speaker or not yet. We're still working on it. So we'll let you know in due course about next week's seminar and future seminars. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your Wednesday. Thank See you. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.